So this video has been uploaded a few other times, but for maximum exposure, I've decided to re-upload it. It's a presentation done by an Austrian World War II survivor by the name of Kitty Worthman. It's an outline of Hitler's takeover of Austria and all the horrors that ensued. The scary part? Although the attitudes of the Nazis were different, we see a lot of similarities to leftist so-called progressive policies today. This includes things like socialism, gun control, and the sometimes violent response to those who express ideas they don't agree with. If every American, especially those in my own age bracket, saw this video, their views on things like socialism, gun control, free speech, and many other issues would have the potential to change dramatically. I hope you enjoy Ms. Worthman's presentation. If it hits you as hard as it did me, then please share this video on social media. If you want to see more videos like this, please be sure to hit that like button and also consider subscribing. Enjoy. Thank you for inviting me here to your beautiful state of California. The media still claims that Hitler rolled into Austria with tanks and guns and took us over. Not true at all. The fact is that the Austrian people elected Hitler by 98% of the vote by means of the ballot box. Now, how could that happen in a Christian nation almost 100% Catholic that they would elect a monster like Hitler. Hitler did not look like a monster. He did not act like a monster. He talked like an American politician. <laughs> the year was 1938. Austria was in a very, very deep depression. We had more than 30% unemployment, we had 25% inflation, and if you borrowed money from the bank, you paid 25% interest. Oh That's why farmers were going broke, businesses were going broke, they could not pay their mortgage, or they could not pay their taxes. What was even worse, we had riots in our cities. We had whole blocks of the cities burned down, and our law enforcement was almost helpless. They could not control the riots. The unions were calling for strikes, and industry would close, and factories would close up, hence all this unemployment. It was not unusual in my home that 30 people a day would knock on the door for a bowl of soup and a slice of bread. They could keep themselves alive by going door to door. There were no jobs. There were young people, college graduates, no jobs. The media told us that in Germany, where Hitler ruled since 1933, they had full employment, they had a high living standard, and everybody was driving the little beetle car, the Volkswagen. We did not hear a whisper that anybody was being persecuted or arrested. We only heard good things. And of course, we spoke the same language. We spoke German. We had the same culture. There was only a border between us, Austria and Germany, like South and North Dakota. And we said, why not? We, we would like to have the same high living standard what Germany had, and of all the things, jobs. People wanted to work. Austrian people are not, are not lazy, they want to work. So, the Austrian people petitioned the government for a plebiscite, for an election. And, and hence, the Austrian people elected Hitler by 98% of the vote. So we got a new government, 
National Socialism. I translate for you National Socialismus from the word National, the word Nazi derived. So we were getting a Nazi government. Nobody was elected anymore from the school board, the city commission, the county commission, legislature and governors, they were, they were all appointed. Well, we thought they would only pick the very best people to govern us. Just like in Germany, we trusted them. We did not ask question. So the first thing what happened, we had to carry national ID cards. You could not board a bus, you could not board a train without showing your national ID card. Don't ever let that happen here. Very bad idea. The next thing what happened, Hitler gave us free radios. Mm. So we could listen to him. He was a great orator. And then he nationalized the radio station. And we were warned if we would turn on a foreign radio station like British Broadcasting or Switzerland, death penalty. Nobody turned on a foreign radio, radio station because you know what the, what, what death, the death penalty meant. So the newspaper, before it hit the street, it was being censored by the government. So the only voice what we had was the government radio station and the government controlled newspaper. So a lot of new things happened very quick. Hitler gave us equal rights. Oh, that sounded so very good. Equal rights for everybody. Also, everybody was, get, was uh, getting a guaranteed income from the government. Mm. The Equal Rights, here we call it the Equal Rights Amendment. Equal Rights was designed in two components. Equality, uh, economics, and social. Economics, that was designed to equalize the country's wealth because everybody was entitled to a guaranteed equal income. In order to achieve that, they had to raise our taxes up to 70% to equalize the wealth, those who were on the lower income level, to graduate them up there to an equal level. They got subsidized housing, they got um, food stamps, they got heating fuel, and they got a certain amount of payment from the government for each child. So they equalized the, the country's wealth by taxing us 70% to bring that label, the lower income level, into an equal level, and that is called socialism. Yes. On the social level, of course, under socialism, everybody has to be in the workforce. Before Hitler, of course, the moms stayed home, they were good wives, and they raised their families. But under socialism, if you are not in the workforce, you are called a parasite. So the moms were, putting, were being put out into the workforce. So what happened to the children? Child care centers. Mm -hmm. You could, and they, it was all free for everybody. You could bring your four months old baby, leave it there 24 hours, um, seven days a week. As long as you left your child there, the better the government liked it. The staffers 
of the child care centers. They were not the grandmotherly type of women who took care of the children. They were young women, highly skilled in child psychology to mold the little babies from four weeks on up how, they want, how the government wanted them. The government raised our children. So that was the equality, equal rights for everybody. The next thing would happen, education was nationalized. We had a very good educational system in Austria before Hitler. I went to public school. We had a very good curriculum. We even prayed in public school before class and after class. That morning, after the election, I walked into my classroom and the crucifix was gone. And the teacher said this morning, we greet each other, Heil Hitler. And she said, we don't pray anymore. We sing Deutschland, Deutschland über alles. Germany above everybody. And she also said, we would not have twice a week religious education anymore either. We would have physical education instead. Oh, we did not mind that. It was a lot more fun to play ball than study the Bible or l learn long prayers. She also said that on Sunday, we could not go to church anymore because Sunday was compulsory National Youth Day. We had to attend at 8 o'clock in the morning to the gymnasium instead of going to church. The first two hours, we had political education. Today, I would call it political indoctrination. We were being told not to listen to our parents. They were just old-fashioned, old fogies. They did not understand the young people. Only Hitler did. So don't listen to your parents anymore. And besides, you had freedom and you had rights. So our parents could not tell us anymore when to come home at night. We could decide that for ourselves. The rest of the day, we had sports. We got all the sports equipment free. We got tennis rackets. We got skis, everything. And the boys of age 16, they got motorcycles. And of course, everybody had to join the Hitler Youth. That was compulsory. So the rest of the day, we had sports and fun. So when we returned home at night, we told our parents, how much fun we had and how much better it was and all the sports equipment we got free, much more fun than going to church. Well, my parents were very concerned, especially my mother. So when my next school term came about in October, she announced that she would enroll me in a private school with an excellent curriculum, but not much fun. <laughs> Off we went to the new school, high wall around, and a locked iron gate. And as I bid my mother goodbye at the gate, I almost hated her. <laughs> I thought she was going to put me into a prison. But she was a wise woman. She said, <clears throat> Today, you do not understand why I'm doing this for you. But when you grow up a bit, you will understand. Had my mother not intervened, today I would be a radical Marxist. So, on holidays, I could go back home for, for a visit. Of course, I was curious. I would go back to my former classmates and find out what was going on. I was shocked. 16-year-old girls 
were having babies for Hitler. And that was glorified. Oh, Hitler wanted a lot of babies. <clears throat> Blonde hair and blue eyes. The master race. I was shocked. So that was our educational system. <clears throat> Hitler also nationalized our car industry. Austria built a little car a little bit bigger than a Fiat. Hitler said, we don't need another little car. We already have the Beetle car, the Volkswagen. So he turned the car industry <clears throat> into a defense industry. Also, Hitler nationalized our banks. Hitler said, those greedy banks, they were the ones who charged 25% interest. And that is why the farmers were going broke and the businesses were going broke. And he looted the Jewish banks. So our banks were being nationalized. Next thing, what happened? He nationalized our health care system. Mm. We had, <clears throat> we had a, um, a reasonable good health care system, which was financed by private insurance. We had good hospitals. We had good doctors. And everybody was reasonable well being cared for. This all changed very fast. My brother-in-law, who was a family physician, he told me that when he arrived at his office at 8 o'clock in the morning, 40 patients would, would be lined up waiting for him to be cared for. He said it was like practicing medicine on a conveyor belt. He only had time, five or 10 minutes pro patient, and besides all the paperwork, it, it was, it was a, a system from, from well taken care uh, health care to a very, very bad system. <clears throat> and what was even worse, he told me that naturally all the doctors were being salaried by the government. There was no more free market. Free market did not exist anymore. The government salaried all the doctors. So my brother-in-law was a very conscientious doctor. He would only prescribe med medication what the patient really needed. But if that medication was not on the government's list, they took it out of his salary. And his salary dwindled down to almost nothing. So a lot of doctors left the country. A lot of doctors left, including my own husband. My husband did not want to practice medicine like his brother had to. He wanted free market medicine. He came to this country, and I remember telling him, telling me, how wonderful our healthcare system was, how modern our hospitals were com compared to what he left behind. He said, I hope it will never change. Today, he would turn over in his grave how healthcare will change. Also, of course, under a socialist government, you have a lot of rules and regulation. We had a planning agency that was designed to control the businesses and the farmers. The bureaucrats, oh, we had tons of bureaucrats. That's how Hitler created jobs, government jobs. Lot, a lot of bureaucrats. And they would go out on the farms and count the livestock and tell the farmers what to plant, how much to plant, and how much they had to harvest, regardless of the weather. 
They would go into the businesses and snoop around what they could find under the auspices of health and safety. Mm -hmm. Here we call it OSHA. They were nitpicking everybody, nitpicking everybody. And I hear that a lot of time from my audiences, how the bureaucrats come into their business and look, snoop around what they can criticize and what the business owner had to replace. And that's why a lot of businesses in Austria could not afford replacement, whatever, whether it was um, round tables versus uh, square tables <clears throat> and, and more bathrooms. So a lot of businesses closed their doors. So also the bureaucrats would go out on the farms and count the chickens and order the chickens how many eggs they had to lay. <laughs> That's right, ridiculous. Absolutely, absolute ridiculous. Hitler wrote a book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. He wrote in the book everything what he was going to do, that he was going to take over the world. But the Austrian people were so busy with athletics and sports, so very few people read the book. Had we read the book, we would have known what was coming. We would have known what was coming. Abortions were highly illegal. Hitler wanted a lot of babies, blonde hair and blue eyes, the master race. <clears throat> but when a couple was not 100% Aryan and the woman was uh, pregnant, she was forced to have an abortion. Hitler did not want any foreign blood, only the Aryan pure German blood. We also had euthanasia, killing people. In my last year of college, I was sent to a small village to do my practice teaching. Maybe I should back up and tell you what really happened in education. When the time came to pick your major in college, I wanted to be a journalist and writer. I was told they didn't need journalists, they did not need writers either. They needed young teachers. So I had to go into education. I did not mind that because I like children. So in my last year in college, I was sent to a small village in the mountains and I was told that because in the winter time, <clears throat> the mountain passes would close up because of the masses of snow. So people in that village, they intermarry family into family. And we know by genetics that sometime the offsprings, the baby, is a bit mentally handicapped. So when I arrived in that village, <clears throat> I was told they had about 15 of mentally handicapped people. One man I know very well, <clears throat> he was the janitor in our school, Vincent. He could not read or write, he could not talk very well, but he kept our school clean. Hmm. So one morning, I looked out of my classroom window and there was a van out there from the health department. I thought, well, and all these people were being ushered into the van. And so I asked my principal, where are they going to take Vincent and all the rest of the people? I thought maybe they take him for an outing for a picnic. The principal said, oh no, the health department came around and asked the parents if they want to institutionalize their son or daughter to learn how to read and write. Gladly the parents signed the papers and off they went. Six months later, 
the letters came to the parents that their son or daughter died a natural but merciful death. The news traveled very fast in that village. People said, well, they all left in excellent health, in good health. And why should they all die within six months? It dawned on the villagers that they were being euthanized. After the war, I found out that 20,000 children, handicapped children, were being euthanized. Hitler wanted perfect people. On a personal note, God forbid, should I ever become handicapped, I will never apply for a handicapped license plate <laughs> because I don't want to get on the list. Amen. And I know that under Obama's health care, we have eugenics. And that means those of us who are getting old, like me, I'm 87 years old, there is no more money for us. <clears throat> so that was euthanasia. We also had a federal police force, secret police, commonly known as the Gestapo, and they were everywhere in civilian clothes. You didn't know who they were. People disappeared all the time, and nobody knew where people were being taken. Nobody knew, but people disappeared. And the Gestapo, they watched everybody, everybody's coming and goings, because we had national ID cards, and of course you could not board a bus or a train without showing your national ID card. They keep track on us, and we were being so scared. The most scared of everything we were of the Gestapo, the secret police. This is how it worked. Since the war was going on, all our food was being rationed. We got one pound of sugar a month. So in, if somebody in your family passed away like grandma, you quickly took that coveted sugar coupon and went to the grocery store and bought that pound of sugar. The next day, the Gestapo would knock on your door and say, we know that you did not turn in the sugar coupon. You bought that pound of sugar, but I am not going to arrest you. But you have to inform on your boss, your neighbor, your friend, everybody you know, and report to our office once a week. They created a network of informers. We could not trust our neighbors. We could not trust our friends. We couldn't trust anybody. We couldn't trust the mailman. Nobody. We were afraid to talk to anybody, anything political, because we did not know who was informing on everybody. A network of informers they created. I believe it was in February 09. I'm a lobbyist in our capital in South Dakota. And that morning I drove to our capital about around 8 o'clock. And I had the car radio on and the news was being reported. And there was President Obama saying, if anybody, if you hear anybody criticizing me, call the White House. Yep. Yep. When I arrived in the Capitol, I quickly want to ask some of, to verify, I asked some of the legislators if they heard the same story and they said, yes, we also heard that. Can you imagine creating a, a network of informers informing and call the White House? Yes, it's happening. Um, we also had gun control. 
the government said that children were playing with guns and we had hunting accidents, people accidentally shooting each other, and we had criminals again, murderers. The only way that they could track the murderer was by the um, serial number of the gun. So bring your, your gun to the police station, then we can register the serial number and we can track the criminal. And we thought that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. So gladly we did that. Not long afterwards, they said no, it did not help. We could not track all the criminals. The best way to have no more crimes and no more people getting hurt, bring your guns to the police station and they already know who had guns because we registered our guns. Keep your guns and buy more guns and <laughs> and stack up on, on your ammo. <laughs> a gun is no good if you don't have any ammo. Dictatorship did not happen overnight. It took five years from 1938 until 1943, we had a full blown dictatorship. Had we kept our guns, we would have fought a bloody battle to the last men and women to keep our freedom. But we had no guns. A classic example is, in Switzerland, it is law that everybody has to have a gun. And Hitler took every country in Europe except Switzerland. And Switzerland did not have a war for more than 600 years. Hitler never tackled Switzerland. So keep your guns. <laughs> keep your guns. <clears throat> like I said, the only information what we had, what the government provided for us, the, the, the nationalized radio station, and the censored newspaper, nobody could get come in and nobody could get out. We had no information, none whatsoever. We did not know that we had concentration camps. We found that out after the Americans and the Allies liberated us that we had concentration camps and we were shocked. We were totally shocked. When the people fear the government, that's tyranny. But when the government fears the people, that's liberty. We have to take our country back as we know it. And a good way is that we educate our friends, everybody, I have my speech on a DVD. I urge you to have house parties, play my DVD, invite your neighbors, your friends, and educate them on socialism. We are almost 80% there. We have to take our country back as we know it. Those of us who sailed past the Statue of Liberty we came to a country of unbelievable freedom and opportunity. America is the greatest country in the world Amen. if we can keep it. So I just want to thank you guys for taking the time to watch this powerful presentation by Miss Worthman, and I really hope it was some good food for thought. Again, if this video hit you like it hit me, I would implore you to share this video with your friends on social media or any other way you see fit. If you want to see more content like this, be sure to like this video and hit that subscribe button. Keep fighting the good fight. This is Extreme Conditions signing out.